Hey, this is Garrett T. Caps, and you're listening to Walking the Floor. I'm walking the floor over you. Walking the floor. I'm walking the floor. Walking the floor over you. Hola, senores and senoritas. This is Chris Shiplett, and you are listening to another edition of Walking the Floor. It's a uh, overcast, kind of moist, clammy day here in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm recording this in my hotel room. Got a gig tonight with the Blackberry Smoke over at the Fillmore. Very excited about that. Hooked back up with uh, with those fellas after a fun week of shows with Elizabeth Cook and Kendall Marvel all up and down the West Coast, and then uh, and then headed out to Wichita, Kansas to reconnect with the Blackberry Smoke Tour. And I gotta say, we had a pretty magic show in Wichita at the Cotillion Ballroom. I don't know, all, all the shows have been great with Blackberry Smoke, um, but that one in particular, I don't know, there was just something special in the air. It was a freezing ass cold Monday night and um and that club was just super cool and the vibe with the people i don't know just seemed festive wichita will be back unfortunately the next day in oklahoma city got canceled because of a freaking ice storm so we uh started our day out thinking we'd have a casual drive down to oklahoma city and a you know play a nice rock show down there at the diamond ballroom but it turned into like a freaking 10 hour odyssey through uh, biblical storm after biblical storm and ice and sleet and rain and ugh, it was a mess. That day was, uh, well, that was a terrible day. Very depressing. Very depressing day in the van. And, uh, and I gotta say, the Applebee's in Shreveport leaves a lot to be desired. You need to try a little harder there, Shreveport, Applebee's. And then at the end of that whole day, I went to my, uh, 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 my bathroom in my crappy hotel room in Shreveport at whatever it was, the Hilton Garden Inn. It was terrible, terrible. Uh, and went to go wash my face after a long day of, you know, struggle and grabbed my washcloth and opened it up and there was just a big old gnarly pubic hair on it. I was like, ah, it's the perfect end to a perfect day, goddammit. Can't win. Just call it a loss. Anyway, uh, yesterday we drove down here to New Orleans, and um, and then we got the show tonight, and then tomorrow night we're playing the Ryman, the Mother Church in Nashville. I'm so excited. Sold out show at the Ryman. It's going to be a good one. Uh, and then the night after that, on Saturday, I reconnect for more acoustic solo gigs with, uh, with Elizabeth Cook and Kendall Marvel, and that's going to be in Memphis at the High Tone. Saturday night, come on Memphis, come on Rob Baird, uh, come and see us, and uh, and then we're going to be all over the, the Southland for uh, you know the next week or so, and that tour ends in Nashville at the Basement East, and uh, yada yada yada, just keep on trucking, everybody. Uh, real quick, wanted to mention that support for Walking the Floor comes from Dedario. Dario, a fine maker of USA-made instrument strings and musical accessories, is committed to sustainability through the playback program, recycling over one million used instrument strings. For more information on the playback program, uh, visit playback.dedario.com. And of course, Zounds.com. Our good buddies over there, Zounds.com, where if you're a musician, that's where you got to go on the internet to get all your supplies, man. Because every order. Uh, five hundred and ninety nine dollars and above is eligible for their exclusive twelve part payment plan and there's free shipping on every single order so get over there zounds.com all right let's uh let's get to today's interview okay so today's interview is with my man Garrett T Caps. I love this guy. Um, I got turned on to Garrett's music on Twitter, actually. I don't even remember exactly how, but somebody must have linked us in the same tweet, and, uh, and I found his music, I think particularly his song, um, uh, In the Shadows Again. 
And I listened to it, and I was like, whoa, who is this guy? He's incredible. It's like it ticks all of my boxes. It's, uh, it's spooky and cosmic country, psychedelic, but it's also moving and kind of gets your heart beat and makes you want to, like, break furniture or something. Um, I don't know. I dig it. I dig his music. He uh, Somehow we got a little back and forth going on the Twitter, and, uh, and turned out he was coming out to L.A. to do a bunch of shows. And I, in fact, blagged my way onto his show at the Redwood Bar and went down there and opened up for him. And that day, he came by Walking the Floor World Headquarters, and we did this interview, and it's fantastic. Because Garrett T. Caps is fantastic. And make sure you listen all the way to the end, because we have here, ladies and gentlemen, an exclusive acoustic performance of his brand new song, Going Far, which is going to be on his next record. But in the meantime, listen to his first two records after you listen to this. This is Garrett T. Caps on Walking the Floor. This is Walking the Floor World Headquarters, after all. One of these days, I'm actually going to hang some shit on the wall and take some time to, to make it look nice. It's like every time I interview anybody in here, like take a picture with them, it's always like really dreary yellow and just <laughs> looks shitty, and you got to put like 8,000 filters on it. But yeah, someday, that's my goal. Right on. All right, let's jump in here. Um, all right, so you're based in San Antonio, right? I am. And is that where you grew up? Are you, I, uh, are you like a San Antonio native? Because I, I noticed San Antonio, like, there's a lot of San Antonio pride coming yeah. out of your social media. Totally. Uh, I was born in San Antonio. I have a song ca- called Born in San Antonio. <laughs> right, yeah, sure. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I've moved around Texas over the years, but I, uh, okay. I've been in San Antonio for the past five or six years, and that's kind of where I started uh, playing more of my, writing a lot of more songs under my name and right. stuff like that. Why were you writing songs like not under your name? Well, I was playing in other bands. Oh, uh, okay. I, I'm kind of a drummer. Oh, but like as a solo artist, yeah. right, like, right, right. I started my solo stuff back home in San Antonio. And, um, and what's like what's the music scene like there? I don't really know San Antonio well. It's like one of the places in Texas that we don't seem to go to often. Right. Like, as a matter of fact, I don't know if I've ever been to San Antonio, but I feel like maybe I've played there once or something. Yeah. Um, I think I I was actually at. The Foo Fighters gig in San Antonio, maybe in like 2004. Does San Antonio, is that the city that has like a nice like river walk kind yeah. of thing? Right, okay. Then I, okay. <laughs> but I, uh, I mean, I've, so I've probably been to like only the most touristy part of San Antonio. Right. You know For what I mean? Sure. So like, what's, I mean, what's the music scene really like there? So the music scene in San Antonio, like the rock kind of oriented stuff is like all over the place. It's totally not very cohesive. There's a bunch of talented people <laughs> that, uh, don't there's a lot of aimless rock and roll happening down there right but uh i like aimless rock and roll but i mean in the alternative world it's kind of a mess but i mean we got all this cultural culturally significant stuff happening down there like the conjunto um stuff and there's a bunch of big tejano bands right yeah based in san antonio so i mean i for country rock and roll kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, the scene for that kind of starts right outside of town when you're heading up north towards Austin. I mean, obviously that's... Right, right. How far from Austin are you? About 70 miles. Oh, shit. So you're like... It's neighbors. like right there. Right, takes, okay. There's some traffic and yeah, stuff, yeah, but yeah, I mean... Sure. I mean, can you talk a little bit about like sort of... Like Texas, you know, anybody that's listened to my podcast over the years knows like, uh, like I'm kind of fascinated by Texas and the yeah. music, the sort of insular nature of the music scene there and the way it's like the last remaining place probably in America that has like its own scene of Texas bands that can like right. tour Texas and make a great living and like people from Texas love Texas music. Like it's, you can't say the same for anywhere else that I know of in, you yeah. know, in America. I mean, it's amazing. That's what, I mean... I didn't listen to country music a whole lot growing up. Right. I also know, I mean, not directly, but like I grew up listening to a lot of gritty, grittier classic rock, like the Rolling Stones stuff. But sure, you sure. You know, that has country music in it. Yeah. But just being in the, like near the hill country, which the hill country basically starts like right on the northern edge of San Antonio, which is kind of where I grew up. Right. So, uh, I mean, I was always around that stuff and like my family isn't like some country music jamming family or whatever we're just a suburban san antonio family but right 
Like, I grew- hold on, you didn't grow up picking your banjo on the front porch with no. your dad. God damn it! <laughs> Definitely You're blowing not. your whole bio here, son. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean the the music scene, like in the hill country, um, in northern San Antonio. Like, I grew up always kind of brushing shoulders with like the Steve Earle and Robert Earl Keen right. stuff, and then yeah, like. Yeah. I don't know, the whole red dirt phenomenon. Yes. Uh, you know, when I was in high school, like I had a bunch of friends that like were into that stuff and that's where you'd go to party. And yeah, yeah, so yeah. So we'd go see- Who like, are some of the big red dirt bands? Like we'd go see Corey Morrow. Right. Or, uh, I mean, Pat Green was pretty big, I guess, in the late 90s. And mm-hmm. well, that's when he broke and Randy Rogers. Sure. Um, Still going. Yeah, I mean they're all yeah. they're all. Big, Randy Rogers seems to have kind of broken out of broken out beyond that, whereas a lot of folks don't don't seem to. Yeah, you know, like why go play fucking a couple states over to nobody when you can play to a big crowd at home? It seems you know? that way. I mean, and it is amazing how you can just tour Texas and make a living off it and play yeah. killer shows, a good living all the time, and like the Thursday, Friday, Saturday, yeah, kind of situation that a whole yeah, yeah. bunch of my friends do. Um, and seem to really like it. Yeah, I mean, that that's interesting because listening to your music, I was curious about sort of what your key influences were and if you came up, you know, nowadays in America, in the, in, you know, the big, the big umbrella that is, you know, Americana or Roots or however you want to right. define it. You know, there's more people, it seems like now that came up and are playing that kind of stuff that actually listen to country music growing up, whereas the early stuff was like guys that came from like rock and roll or punk rock, you know yeah. what I mean? Like a lot of it, really. For sure. Um, and and in your music, like I kind of I I didn't know if I was misreading it, but I hear like X and shit like that. So I didn't yeah. know if you came more from that side of the aisle. I mean, I grew up listening to rock rock and roll, right? And I mean, I've I've always been really musically like I, I've the mel- melody and like everything but the lyrics was like a big thing for me, like right. growing up. And uh, everything but the lyrics. Yeah, like I never cared about the lyrics or anything. Yeah. I just like sang along to the song i don't know what that says about me but it's I, funny you know i was kind of the same way like there i would maybe like a one line or two lines or something would really resonate but like i couldn't sit down and play you and sing through my favorite songs right you know what i mean i never like it i that wasn't where my brain went i think i was listening to what the guitar player was doing for sure too, too much or something and i don't know um i loved uh mostly just rock and roll stuff i mean i wasn't like a punk rocker dude, but I mean, I listen to everything, man. Yeah. And uh, hell, the I guess growing up in the '90s, like there was a bunch of like alt country oriented stuff on the radio. Sure, sure, sure. Like I love that album. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, I love that album, uh, "Bringing Down the Horse" by the Wallflowers. Yeah, fuck yeah, which, yeah, great record. There's a bunch of great songs on yeah. that one. I like knew all the lyrics to all those songs, but I never thought of it as like a country situation, right? But, um, I mean, I started playing drums in my... That's what I played my whole life. Oh, uh, okay. So, so were you a drummer in other bands? Yeah. Or prior to... I got... When I was... I got real into, like, garage rock and roll. Right. And I, and then I got real Like, in, who are the bands? Like, the Humpers and that sort of thing? Or, like, uh, <laughs> or like old 60s, like... You yeah. Know, right. I mean, I like a lot of the old 60s stuff, but, I mean... I, I like the a lot of the current stuff too. Uh, I mean, some of my favorites. This is kind of dorky, but some of my favorite stuff to play along to as a kid was like the first Foo Fighters record. Yeah, oh, there you go. Okay, <laughs> Alone and Easy Target. Uh, the drum do solo. Have, in do you have some? Uh, do you have some Grohl drum lick chops? Yeah. in your arsenal. And uh, I, I, well, I've tried. <laughs> but uh you know i got real into queens of the stone age as a kid yeah yeah sure and uh but i mean before that i was listening to a lot of classic stuff like the who or the stooges or you know some yeah, of these yeah. more just like no frills classic rock guys yeah sure but uh and what sort of what sort of piqued your interest in the countryside of things um well i think at a certain point i got i went and saw steve Earle live at Floors Country Store. I think he was turning off the Revolution Starts Now. Ah, uh, that's a good record. Record, and there's something about that. It was really wild. It was like a politically charged um, event. Right. 
It's funny looking back now that we thought that was the end of the world. Yeah. Yeah. We had no exactly. idea. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I certainly had no idea. Yeah. But something about just kind of like the attitude and how it was uh, real edgy, but like and heavy, but it was like all right about these catchy like country songs and with some rockers thrown in. And yeah, yeah. I got pretty heavy into Steve Earle and that kind of. I kind of opened the floodgates for all the guys that influenced him, like Townsend, Guy Clark. And, right. But so then you just kind of work your way back. Yeah. And I always thought that country music was kind of uncool or something. But then I, right. then I realized like how much of an impact the culture has had on me growing up. Sure. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of guys like Robert L. Keane. And yeah, yeah. I got real into all the Austin stuff. Uh, Jerry Jeff Walker and yeah, the Armadillo yeah. World Headquarters yeah, that's good situation. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, was it that kind of blow your mind when you started peeling back that onion, like all the shit that was right there on your doorstep? You yeah, know, that, that, for sure. That had been there on your doorstep, you know? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I've always been kind of fascinated with, especially in San Antonio, like uh, what bands had played there a long time ago. Right, yeah, yeah. And like what shows. I mean, obviously heavy metal in San Antonio was like a big thing. Right. But I found out at one point like how ripping the honky tonk scene was down oh, there like, yeah it must have been right before before like i mean i grew up thinking austin was like i mean we always lose our shows to austin to right. this day right but, sure but uh back in the day it was the opposite yeah and like all the classic guys were playing like all the these badass places like the farmer's daughter and, and stuff like that yeah it's funny man i have a very similar experience where you know, there used to be, Southern California used to be just littered with honky tonks all over LA, all over Southern California, all over the West Coast. It was just every right. town had big barn dances, little honky tonks bars, the whole thing. I mean, it was a huge country music scene on the West Coast back in the day. But when, when I was, you know, a teenager and young adult going to shows, you know, most of those places were long since closed down or, you know, kind of, you know, on the skids or whatever. So a lot of, but a lot of the, you know, they still existed. And so you go to like punk rock shows or heavy metal shows at like the Palomino yeah. or the fucking Foothill or these places that you had no idea the history of it because I didn't give a shit at that point. I didn't, right. I didn't know anything about it. I'd see pictures, there'd be pictures of Buck Owens on the wall and you go, who the fuck are those old guys, yeah. you know? Don't and you worry just about had no it, yeah. idea what, you, what, the, what had happened in those rooms, man. Yeah. And it was like many years later, I looked back and went, whoa, no shit. Like you read sort of histories of West Coast country and stuff. go, whoa, I was totally in that room. But many years later. Yeah, for sure. It takes time, I guess. Yeah. But uh, yeah, San Antonio's, uh, I mean, I, and then I, I, of course, found out about Doug Somm. Right. And, Have you watched that documentary? Oh, yeah. That's for sure. That's a great documentary. Yeah. And uh, just like the how he kind of like carried the San Antonio sound and attitude up to like well into the big world of rock and roll back in the early days yeah yeah but then like going into the 70s and he was the dude from san antonio yeah i mean is anybody going yeah. to san antonio i mean actually like augie myers is still lives in san antonio oh and, really uh, like we've played some shows with him recently no shit <laughs> it's wild knowing yeah. that i mean it's easy. Have to you been embraced a bit from some of your, you know, the the Texas legends? Um, I don't like. Have you gotten to interact with them? I guess. You yeah, know I, mean, I mean, like warm up, warm up their shows and that sort of thing. Yeah, well, even, right. When we released this record a few months ago, we did a big release party with Flacco Jimenez and Augie Myers. Wow, no and uh, we played my song "Born in San Antonio" at the end of the night yeah. with like Augie and and uh, it was cool. Like, it seems like there's a good buzz going on yeah. down there. Like, especially with Austin's growth and, like, everyone just is starting to it's starting to outpour and we're starting to see all these people show up in San Antonio. Like, the, people that are like, fuck it, Austin's gotten it too crowded. We're going to, what's the next best thing? Or whatever. Thing? Oh, well, yeah. there's this huge city that's extremely sleepy and relaxed and affordable. Right. Right down right. the road. And all right. anyone really thinks about is the Riverwalk or the San Antonio Spurs or the Alamo. Right. But, uh, you know, I've, I've been bringing a whole bunch of friends down. I host shows all the time. Oh, and, cool. And uh, people seem to really dig it down there. I well, love it. So at what point did you sort of make the switch from, from being a drummer in rock bands to fronting your own thing and writing songs and singing and all that? Yeah. I, so have you been to San Marcos, Texas? It's outside of, it's outside of Austin. I don't know. Um, it's a cool hill country 
It's a college town. Okay. But uh, it's probably like 15 minutes south of Austin if there's no traffic or whatever. On, but, on, uh, a, on a totally unrelated question, but since you asked me about something that's outside of Austin, have you been to fucking Style Station? Oh, yeah. Um, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's ah. uh, in uh, West On the way Texas, to Fort Worth kind of thing. Yeah, between yeah. Austin and, and Fort Worth. I stopped Worth by there last time I, I drove through. Oh, that place is in. I, that guy is so funny. Yes. He's insane. That guy was, In a good way. What's that guy's name? I don't know, but I have it in my in my uh, in my uh, contacts. Yeah, because it's just so nuts. They had some pretty sick threads too. Um. We heard about that from Mitch that plays drums with Dwight Yoakam. Uh huh. And there's this whole story with I think Dwight's bus broke down right outside of there, and I don't know if that's how they met the guy or what. But there's this whole thing with the, him coming out and trying to help them get their bus going or whatever. And, and so my buddy Mitch had told me this whole story. And he was like, the guy's kind of nuts. You know, but you, you got to go in there. It's just crazy, you know, vintage everything. You know, yeah. it just looks like a, a junkyard until you go in there. It's bananas. And so we went in there and the guy immediately started like, he wasn't like yelling at us in, an, in a mean way, but kind of very aggressively talking at all of us. And we yeah. said, oh, we're friends with Mitch. And he went, God, Mitch, that motherfucking asshole. And Dwight Yoakam, mother, blah, blah. He just went, it was like fucking, it was everything Mitch had warned us it would be and yeah. more. And you're you like know? trapped in there for Total, a while. It was great. Yeah, happily. Yeah, I love that place. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go back by there as soon as I can. Anyway, San Marcos. So San Marcos is kind of like, definitely has this hill country vibe to it. And, and like when I was living there, I got that was when I kind of started getting into a lot of this songwriter stuff and and uh, starting to try to write some songs and right that is what happened and uh, I didn't record an album until a few years maybe like 2012 or 13 I didn't start doing my solo stuff until then and ha- what your latest one is what your third record it's my or second full length second full length okay but uh, I don't know there's something about it it's like kind of like a classic story like. In some ways, like I, I got really into the music and I started seeing going to shows and like thinking that's something that I would be able to do. Um, so I started trying doing it. And so, okay, so who, who, what's the name of the label that puts your records out now? Shotgun House. Shotgun House. And what's the what's their little tagline? Something like hit making uh, records. Hill Country hit making machine. <laughs> right. Um, is that who put? If they put out all your records? Um. Just this one, and, oh, he, okay. and uh, he's working on a few others from some really cool artists. So. How'd, how'd you put out your, your your first record? It was just on CD. Just did like you printed it up yourself kind yeah. of thing? Oh, okay. That's the one that has my song Born in San and Tone on it, and it right. seems to be... Is that the one? <laughs> it That's seems the magic to be the song? song that people have caught on to, okay. which I didn't think that the people uh, outside of San Antonio would like that song, and then over the years, playing it outside of town, it's become like this thing where... Played at the end of the set, and it's this big shit show. And then, like, all of a sudden, like, now people everywhere seem to enjoy the song. There's something about it they like. Do you get, like, Texas as expats coming to your shows in Connecticut and shit like that? Yeah, pretty right. much. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. were some out this past evening. <laughs> oh, okay. Wearing Spurs shirts and stuff. I mean, all you got to do is yell about stuff that, like, really, all I do in that song is yell about specific stuff. Right. I, like restaurants or yeah yeah, yeah. Tacos well, that's or funny because that sort of supports the theory that the more specific your songwriting is the more relatable it yeah. will be which is like the opposite of what you would think you know you think you need to get real vague so everyone can you know get it but it's the opposite right it's like you got to get real down and you know laser point fucking specific and it's always felt like a cheap shot in some ways but <laughs> but, but then again like being able to connect with yeah. people like that in some ways just by you know, I, if it makes people happy and they come to your shows, then fucking God bless you <laughs> for sure. <laughs> you know, um, and yeah, it's cool to yell about music, the music scene in San Antonio and stuff. Uh, did you ever play Taco Land back in the day? I don't think so, man. I thought you might know about that spot. I don't. When I was in No Use for a Name, which is the band I was in yeah. before Foo Fighters, I don't know if we ever played San Antonio. We definitely we played Houston, Dallas, Austin. You know, we played those those towns all the time, but. Um, I don't know that we ever played San Antonio. Yeah, man. I thought maybe I would have cruised through there. That was like our South Texas CBGBs. Oh, uh, okay. It's like a legendary punk rock club. Right. Yeah, the ones that I always remember were like Emos. Right. And Fitzgeralds. And For sure. Some of those spots, you know. Um, yeah. But, uh, okay, so you, you, cruise, you, you start doing your own thing. You put <laughs> out your, your first couple of records yourself. 
So yeah. I w- so what what led to you putting out your latest one on on this label? Well, I wanted to do like I've my album before this Elos Lonely Hipsters was kind of a product of me just playing playing around Texas over the years. Right. And uh it was just like songs that had been around for a while kind of in the rock and roll uh cowpunk vein yeah. or something, but that wasn't what I was trying to do. I was trying to just write country songs. Right. And they kind of came out that way. But this next time around, I wanted to try and do something a little more out there. And I had a collection of songs and an aesthetic idea for the production of the record. Who who produced it? Um, my friend Lucas Oswald. He he's like he works in the indie indie rock world right. primarily. And I thought it'd be cool to work with him on this one. Yeah. To like get a different angle. Because there's so many great like producers in in the Central Texas area, even this, I mean, a ton of them in the Central Texas area. Right, right. That I could have worked with that make all the great country records and stuff. Sure. But approaching it from a different angle seemed like the right thing to do. Like, how would you describe it? Like, to me, it's got like a cosmic country kind of thing. Yeah. You know, I always think of it as like country music with like an echoplex thrown in there. For you sure. Know? I mean, it kind of came to be like I had this collection of songs. Some of them were old. Some of them were brand new, and I started collaborating with some uh, really experimental artists in in San Antonio that like were really into, like minimalist stuff. Like we, I think we bonded over like listening to Terry Riley or like some of this like hippie composition stuff. Right. And uh, wait, who's Terry Riley? He's like this. He's like he like invented like a style of minimalist like percussive music mm. uh, where you play like a arpeggio on a marimba for he you know like steve reich or uh, phil glass or like in that world okay uh like real soundscapey right, um, right, right. transcendental stuff yeah. and i i got into that and i got into like that led me into like kraut rock stuff like noi oh and can which yeah, like yeah. for like a few years i was just like that's all i listened to just right there's it's so- interesting because oftentimes when people get into that sort of more, I don't know exactly what you call it, experimental ambient, you know, less melodic, shall we say, right. music, it like kills their songwriting. But your songs are like have hooks, you know? They're yeah. Like they're catchy. So I kind of hear the influence you're talking about, but it didn't seem to like ruin your, your ability to write a catchy song. Well, that's what made it hard recording the record because my friend Justin Boyd, who's a sound artist, he he's like... He does all these sound installations and stuff. He like comes from like the art world. Okay. And I come from the songwriting slash being a rock band world. So yeah. like we decided to collaborate and see what we could do to these songs. And we're both excited to be like like working with someone that doesn't like have any experience in the other side. Yeah, yeah. And uh, basically we started running my acoustic guitar through his modular synth setup, which he has like, he like, has. I didn't even know that much about modular synthesizer. Shit, synthesis I don't know anything whatever. about it. <laughs> I mean, they're basically like you know, like a huge rack mount thing, and they're like, is the most badass guitar pedals ever. Like some of the same companies seem to make these uh, modular synth um, things, and they're you know, there's like a bunch of patch cables. You can. It's extremely complicated. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, he started doing live effects to my songs. So sometimes it would sound like there was like a chorus on my acoustic guitar. Right. But all he has to do is hit a knob and then it turns into this just like epic soundscape. You can't even hear um, the percussive parts of it. Oh, wow. But uh, the record was like, I was really pretty adamant on getting it going. Yeah. So like I got a band together and he joined, the, he asked if he could join the band. So that kind of threw us for a loop. Does and, he tour with you? Yeah, I mean, no. Sh- is he doing the modular synth stuff, synth stuff live? Yes. No like, shit. We. I look forward to seeing that this evening. Well, it's not going to be tonight. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like that. Moving forward a little bit, that band we call it, we call it NASA Country. Okay. And it's turned into this collective of like 12 people <laughs> you all you have like an art house vibe to you like i don't know if you have a background in in like the, the visual arts or something anything but they they're they i get some i get that vibe just from what you put out into the world well Is thank that, you i i think that's just hanging out with people that are in artist stuff yeah. right yeah i mean i i don't know i i 
like progression and pushing the music into a, like a different territory um, that I feel like it hasn't been done before is really important to me. Right. Um, and I feel like on this re last record, bringing the modular synthesizer dude in and really trying to push push it out there, but at the same time, like keeping it accessible. And that was like right. what, why that album was such a headache because on one, one half of the band was like, they don't care about the hooks or like making the audience that listens to country music happy and in all in most ways. And then on my end, I'm like, well, these these are just my songs, you right. know? Yeah. And some of these songs were older. We I, we had no intention of like messing with them in that way. And mm. then there's two songs on the record, um, here right now, and Troubles Calling, and those were written like for the band. And you can really tell. Like they let they give it room to breathe and stuff. Right, right, and right. And then some of like the more traditional songs, like we're really trying to figure out like how are we going to incorporate these effects into this song. They just yeah. want it just wants to be like a dance hall song. Right. Well, you know, I, one thing I noticed on the record, am I hearing a lot of lap steel? Yes. Like the steel on there is not pedal steel, it's lap steel, right? Yeah, so my buddy Torin, he plays Hawaiian lap steel. Okay, so was that a stylistic choice to not use pedal steel, which would be sort of the more common thing nowadays? But it's got a, it's got, there's there's a real like there's a vibe to to lap steel, right? It's, you know, yeah, for sure. It's I a mean, different thing. It's kind of what we like. Oh, two weeks before we went in the studio, I my, I knew my friend had this old Fender lap steel, and I got it and I gave it to Torin, the guitarist, and I. Uh, Said, hey man, let's have some lap steel on this record. He'd never played lap steel before. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of a, it was cool in that way. Yeah. And that's what he plays. But there's kind of a like San Antonio does not have like a bunch of like badass touring musicians like just hanging out right. in town all the time. Right, like and, Austin or Nashville right. or somewhere. Right. Sure. And we we're randomly recording the core tracks for this record in this gallery in in Southtown and I found out from a friend of a friend that this pedal steel player was in town. And uh, this is during Fiesta. Like, Fiesta is like Mardi Gras in San Antonio. Uh, okay. It's just like a two week massive party. Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, I don't know why this guy was in town, but this guy named BJ Cole um, was in town, like visiting a friend. And he'd been, he's like this legendary pedal steel player. He's right. a British guy. And like, oh. he happened to be staying like a British pedal steel player. I've never he's heard the of guy. such a thing. You look up his credits, and right. like, he's the guy. He's been right. doing it forever. Oh no shit! And he, uh, like, I think his most famous credit, or it's what people talk about, is he plays like the pedal steel and Tiny Dancer. Oh okay. But I mean, that's a that's a good credit. <laughs> but uh, he's collaborated with a bunch of like kind of psychedelic bands. I mean, like every band, right? Pretty much. And uh, he happened to be staying down the road from us. Uh, when we were recording, and one how like somehow we got a hold of him, and he came over and he cut pedal steel on the opening track, "Born into a Ballroom," and the I thirty five waltz, which is like kind of a more complicated song for me, yeah. and like he just totally destroyed it, and it right. was just like this totally bizarre thing that this guy happened to be staying right down the road from us because. He was he he said he'd come to Austin every summer since the '80s, and this was his first time in San Antonio. Mm. But he like absolutely destroyed. He like he makes a lot of like soundscapes, and he's done a lot of like psychedelic kind of Daniel Lenoir sure, kind of sure, stuff. Sure. Yeah. And uh, it was just like kind of the stars aligned magically in San Antonio. Sometimes you just find the person, you know. You yeah. just found each other. It was really wild. Yeah. So talking about the steel and stuff, like. There's two tracks with pedal steel from uh, the legendary B.J. Cole. Nice. So I think the way that I discovered your music was I was trying to I was thinking about this this morning like how the fuck did I find Garrett's music? I think I saw something on Twitter about yeah, it. No. and it was but it was tied into like you got a song in this in the show Billions. Right. So. <laughs> So how did how did that come about? Because that seems like a big sink for, for it is. you know a, a new an up for me. And well, I mean, I don't have like a like someone doing that work for me, like a, right, which is crazy because yeah, because there's a lot of people pitching those shows. So how did they find yours? So 
like, uh, this is where that song Born in San Antonio comes into play. I wrote that song just to play around town. Yep. And people kind of dig, dig it or whatever, but, like, everyone in San Antonio seems to be, like, kind of late to the game on stuff. Like, they need someone telling them, this song's cool. Like, they, <laughs> they can't just enjoy it for what it is, uh. it seems. But I, like, got on some playlists um, on Spotify, and that song was was one of them. Okay. And uh, Brian Koppelman, the director of that show, who's directed a bunch of movies and shows, but he's a huge music guy. Yeah. And he's like a huge Roots and Americana music guy. Mm. And uh, apparently the song came on like his like Discover Weekly playlist or algorithm generated playlist one uh, day and he just like f- like freaked out or something. He like emailed my email on my webpage. Yeah. And it bounced back. And it, <laughs> like n- no one had like tried to email the specific email. <laughs> my, yeah. <laughs> and like he like messaged me like on all my social media outlets and i like totally like it's like who the hell is this guy yeah. it was brian so Koppelman pulling my leg just, like freaked out over the song yeah and that was like a over a year ago and he kept on saying when i talked to him on the phone oh i'm definitely using this song in my show like however i can help you like i love this song like i was just like all right but seven or eight months later, I finally got this contract to the show. I totally didn't know if it was going to happen. Nice. But, uh... I mean, do you feel that? At, like, do you feel um, an uptick in your streams sure. from that? Or, you know... Definitely. Selling more tickets? Like, people coming... Heard about you on Billions. Like, is that actually... Yeah. Have an I mean, effect? Well, what's cool to me about it is it's, it is my song about San Antonio. It's right. not some other song. Yeah, yeah. And it's the first thing that plays in episode one. Um, of the, of that, the last of season, the new season, yeah, or the last season, and uh, it's like pretty epic how they use it, yeah. And it's like I was born in San Antonio, like immediately, and that show was like heavily pr- promoted and like yeah. gigantic and popular and stuff. Sure. And so immediately, all these people from like all over the world, like they either had a connection to just the kind of rock and roll uh, style of the song, but like all these people from like San Antonio, like everywhere like started following me but i was able to uh kind of prep for the release of the record around that tv show right, coming out right so so that was that was the song off your first record not the current one. right so have you found that um with that kind of stuff happening with you um has the sort of the 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 powers that be that control americana playlists and festivals and things like that have you started have you made inroads in that whole world yeah, I mean, so I'm, like, trying to get on the road a lot more. Right. Um, so that's kind of the idea of me playing with this band, Mayu and Broussard. They're a rock and honky-tonk band, and they've learned oh, some really? of my new songs. Oh, right. And they've been out, been going on the road forever, so right. we're combining forces. But as far as festivals and stuff like that goes, like, I think because of the show, or I'm not exactly, I still am not exactly sure, but, like, uh... Um, Europe and stuff is like oh, wow. starting to catch on. No so, shit. Uh, we're I'm taking my band, the Three Timers, who's my San Antonio band, rock and roll band. I guess I have a few lineups, but we're going to Holland in uh, October, right. and we're gonna play some pretty badass festivals that like are happening. <laughs> right. I mean, they they love like roots music over there. For yeah. Sure. So yeah, like. People uh, seem to be real, real excited about the... What about stateside? Are you touring a lot here? Yeah. We're, right. we're doing a tour in September, and then I'm planning some more stuff in January. Uh, just get going. I was out there as much as possible. Great. And uh, I'm, I'm working on the new record, too. Oh, no. Already? Yeah. Wait, when did the In the Shadows come out? May 5th. Of this? Okay, so you, yeah. you're already that... God damn, man. That's like some 1963 schedule. Well... <laughs> I have some re- like songs that I'm really really proud of, and I, I really want to do like a like a record of just like this last one was very conceptual, right? Aesthetically, and uh, that's cool. I want to incorporate some of that stuff, like yeah, yeah. some of the soundscapes and all that. But like, I've just been like really, really trying to channel um, honesty and like I don't know some. It's been a rough year 
for me in my family and stuff. Oh, really? And uh, songwriting has taken like a whole new form of like therapy, I guess. Sure. And I found these songs that I'm extremely proud of, and they feel good to perform or write. Right. And I have this idea for the record, and I'm just gonna try and knock it out this year. I think it's yeah, gonna be a, an excellent follow up yeah. to to Fantastic. this last one. I like when people put out records just bang, bang, bang. Yeah, That's man, nice. I'm excited for sure. On that end, would you? I know we didn't exactly talk about this, but would you like to perform a song for us now? Sure. Us, and by us, I mean the entire internet. Definitely, <laughs> absolutely. Is this the guitar you use? Yes. Let's you could definitely can use that. I've got a pick. pick. I've got a pick. This song is uh, called Going Far. Um, it will be on my new one whenever it comes out. Long before there were machines and robots wandering these plains, when the stars above us shined a bit more bright, you could hear the lonely whistle of some running in the rain singing songs upon their horses in the night i'm going far away going far away i'm going far i'm going far away if you know just what i'm knowing then you know i'll never stay take me with the wind i'm going far away And on porches rocking slowly, folks could kill an afternoon Just talking about their business and their lives Some wishing they were somewhere else, some wishing they could choose But for now they had their whiskey and their wine I'm going far away, going far away I'm going far, I'm going far away if you know just what I'm doing, then you know I'll never stay. Take me with each sip, I'm going far away. And downtown, when the house was open, men without their wives spent their money in the open rooms upstairs. While their honeys in their homes Tried to rid it from their minds Brewing sweet tea, dreaming of someone who cared I'm going far away Going far away I'm going far, I'm going far away If you know just what I'm knowing Then you know I'll never stay Take me with my dreams, I'm going far away And on the branch of an oak tree Hung a knot tied in a rope With people gathered round a normal circumstance While a shadow of a man With barely skin and bone Cries in terror and they tie up both his hands I'm going far away Going far away I'm going far, I'm going far away If you know just what I'm knowing then you know I'll never stay Take me with the Lord, I'm going far away Take me with the Lord, I'm going far away Woo! Right on. So are you telling me that that was like a world premiere, exclusive new track that the world's never heard before? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming down, Dad. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. That was Guaranteed Caps on Walking the Floor playing his brand new song, Going Far, an exclusive right here on Walking the Floor. Uh, make sure you get on over to walkingthefloor.com. I'm going to put up a bunch of links. 
to all the Garrett T Caps stuff so you can see where he's at, see what he's doing. Um, you know, he's such a cool dude. He actually reached out to me the other day and asked if I wanted to jump on a show he's putting together for South by Southwest. Unfortunately, I already had a show booked that same night, so I'm not going to be able to do it, but uh, I'm sure I will run into him somewhere down there. Love this guy. Uh, okay, I will see you out on the road next week with Elizabeth Cook and Kendall Marvel all over uh, the southern states of America. That's it for this week. We'll see you soon. Adios, amigos!